Hello Ed and Alan, it's great to see you guys here today. Ed is a former recon marine and Alan is a former medic in the Navy. And they've both released an interesting book called Postcards Through Hell, where they were delivering mail to various hotspots in Afghanistan. So how are you guys doing today? Oh, I'm doing good. Yeah, doing yeah. good. Got past the technology part, signed on. <laughs> I just wonder if you'd give me a brief description of your backgrounds before you became contractors in this mail operation. Well, Ed's, Ed's a senior guy, so I'll let him go. Uh, I, I did uh, 20 years in the Marine Corps. I uh, retired as a staff sergeant in E6, but uh, I was mostly uh, infantry and then mostly uh, reconnaissance after that. Uh, I had a lot of good times there. And then uh, right after I retired, a buddy of mine, uh, sent out a uh, email looking for guys to fill uh, quotas for uh, contracting and that's what got me into contracting back in 2004 and then from there I was able to go to a couple of various other contracts ending up with my last one with being with SOC doing the mail contract in Afghanistan so yeah so I did 20 years in the Marine Corps then about another eight uh, uh, doing security work in uh, either Iraq or Af mostly Afghanistan, though. And uh, I'm a former Navy corpsman. Uh, went over at, uh, to Iraq in 2005 and spent five years in Iraq. And then I did three years in Afghanistan as a uh, combat medic for both uh, Dine Corps and uh, SOC. So how does, how does contracting work? Is it people pretty much retired that do contracting? Or, or you can be a contractor if you're still within the, the, the official... Um, salary as a forces member? Oh, no, no. It, 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 no and I know in the U.S. You can't military, contract and be in the military at the same time, no. Yeah, you have to be right. out of the military, DD-214, separated, then you could get into contracting. I know a couple of guys that they got out of the Marine Corps, did contracting for a couple of years, made a lot of money, and then they went back into the Marine Corps. I have heard of a couple of guys doing that. But for the most part, once you're out, that's when you roll into contracting to, uh, you know, build off of your uh, uh, skill set and your experience base that you uh, had in the uh, military. So for us, for me, it was like mostly uh, like shooter uh, uh, special operations. So we went into the PSD side of the. Uh, the PSD side, the convoy side, the movement side of the uh, contracting world. Uh, other than that, that's how we, that's how I got into it, and pretty much that's how I stayed in on uh, the security side. What's PSD? Contract, yeah, yeah, contracting is a pretty broad spectrum term. I mean, people are contractors that provide maintenance services for for generators or air conditioners there's contractors that provide food services and and uh, morale welfare uh services for the military and there's even contractors that do static security at certain places right that but we're we're the kind of contractors that are outside the wire our mission was to deliver united states mail throughout afghanistan so you know we didn't have the, the luxury of of uh, or the safety of, of being on a fob or or whatever we stayed in a villa we provided our own protection we uh we provided our own protection in route on these missions we didn't have any military support so there's a huge difference in the type of contractors that we're talking about here so outside of the wire just means outside of the forward the operating fall. base or yes yeah. fob or villa depending on where you were staying at yeah yeah you're outside we, we the wire yeah, we were we were completely isolated. I mean, yeah. I'm a contractor myself. I'm a, but I'm an IT contractor. So it's a bit different. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there were plenty of those guys over there too that kept up, kept the internet and the Wi-Fi going. But uh, you know, for the most part, they very rarely left the. I mean, guys like that very rarely left the wire. Uh, there was just no need for them to go outside of the wire. Uh, and if they did, we'd put together the package, the motorcade package, to move them from point A to point B and then bring them back to point A. So, 
Contractors a, moving contractors. <laughs> so as a contractor myself, and, and the ones I have like an invoice where I write down like the amount of hours I did this and what is the kind of project it is I did here. Do you like have an end of the month invoice and you write down, I've done X number of miles here. I did this operation. Uh, usually at like the headquarters, like the, the oper- operations level, they would track all the moves. Like, hey, we did uh, 12 PSD moves for the month. Three went to Bagram and seven went to uh, uh, Kandahar. We did uh, 30 mail moves. We did another uh, 10 secure loads for another client. And that's how we would send out our, that's how the, you would send out the billing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, you would actually send out your billing like that uh, based off of uh, how many moves you did, who you were moving. Uh, what was the configuration of the package? Because I know uh, when we would do the our small PSD moves, it was all based off of uh, hours. So pretty much, uh, if you wanted like a full team, it was like, gee, uh, it was uh, X amount a day versus a half a team, and then even then that team. Uh, what are you getting? Uh, if you wanted all Americans, you were paying a lot. If you wanted uh, all, if you wanted a mix of Americans and uh, TCNs, it was uh, less expensive. Uh, sometimes they would go with TCNs and Afghans. TCN, was, uh, third, third country, country national. national. Yeah. So say it's like a U.S. contract, and then you came in on the contract because you're not a U.S. citizen, you'd be considered <laughs> third country right. national. So right, I've got you. Right. It's uh, it's kind of in the military. Uh, the <laughs> comparison is you you know U.S. military and coalition forces. So it would be uh, an expat versus third country national. Right, that would be you. a coalition force versus a, a U.S. military or an expat. Uh, it's it's pretty much the same hierarchy. Even some of our uh, clearances had uh, uh, GS GS uh, nine ratings, etc. GS9 GS9 would be your your government uh, rating or pay grade would be kind of yeah. like equivalent to a colonel or or something of that nature. I'm aware of those kind of like in the UN you have G up to G one two three four five six then P, which is like up to certain levels general staff professional staff and then there's I think there's a high level above that which is like diplomat or something. Yeah, yeah so most of us were GS9 and above. Sounds like a lot of money. Yeah, it, yeah, the paid, money it paid well. Yeah, it paid well. I mean, yeah, for there is a business side to war, as we found out doing this line of work. Uh, that's the big thing there. Uh, and it, it's good because you know what, you're getting paid well, but it's bad because corporate risky. wants to, wants wants it to get into the black. It wants its profit, so. We might come up with ideas to keep the teams a little bit safer. Make the uh, and it might cost like say six million dollars to upgrade all the vehicles and upgrade all the weapon systems. But uh, corporate's going to come back and say, yeah, "I don't think we're going to be spending six million dollars in uh, uh, gratuity and death benefits." So we're just going to go ahead and roll the dice. I mean, oh, it, yeah, it, I mean they they, they it, 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 it's. They they uh, roll it. You have to find that happy medium. So, what was the death rate in that in those mail missions? Oh, geez, oh, we, uh, lost not, 10, I lost. we lost ten guys in three years. Yeah, ten guys in three years, and I'd say about another fifteen were uh, injured due to enemy yeah. action. And uh, I'd say out of that 15, what, maybe about six or seven actually came back to work. So, so how many people was there involved in, in the whole operation any, on the, the vehicles? The at any time had, had like a total of like, uh, geez, 50, I'd say 50, 50, 60 people on it to include our gun, our LN gunners, our uh, our drivers, the uh, ATLs, the medics, and the team leaders, and then, you know, that small headquarters staff that we had, which, incidentally, the headquarters was also a backup team for, like, uh, some of the easier runs. So, 
on the PSD run. So that way, uh, you know, we can get more moves going, make a little bit more money. So PSD again? PSD, personal security detail. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that pretty much that's where we're actually protecting a person uh, versus right. a convoy security. We're just co- protecting the mail or a secure load for another client. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so uh, your book and um, postcards through hell is mostly to do with the, the mail operations, I believe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The mail mm-hmm. and the yeah. secure load operations. Yeah. With for another for for the other client. And, so, and how did you guys meet in the uh, the situation? This, this oh, operations. Wow. We met back in what two thousand five. Yeah, in, in, yeah, in yeah. Iraq. Yeah, I think uh, it was like December or November, December. Yeah, we met then. Put I put Al through the training, and then after that, we uh, uh, we just stayed in touch. You know, we just always stayed in touch. And we all knew Al was a real good medic, and a bunch of us knew of him from uh, Iraq. And then in Af- when I was in Afghanistan, uh, a few other one of the other teams got took a bad hit and took some casualties. That's when we realized, hey, we need an actual uh, we need an actual Medicare on site to uh, build our medical program. So uh, that's when we put Al's hat in the name, and uh, that's when he came on over. So, so this isn't like the military where it, the military has like the medics organized. This is like, hey, we need a we need a medic. Let's provide it through our own <laughs> improvisation here. You know? That's, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. making making the request a medic through the corporate office, and the, and the corporate office will have any number of medics that are listed in their database that are either ready for deployment or already on deployment. And I w- I just happen to be on deployment. And so probably a lot easier, cheaper to send me from Iraq to Afghanistan than to some, bring somebody in stateside. The other thing was I already had the training and exposure being in country for a while. So uh, it was probably a lot easier to do the transition in terms of um, badging and, and security uh, operators license and, and arming authority and things of that nature. So uh, they send me up there and then... Uh, then you go back to school because now they have to train you on uh, a convoy operations. So most of my background was in PSD. So you're there to protect people that have been maybe hit by gunshot wounds or, get, or stabbings or things like that. And then you have to adapt. Oh, to no, no it's way beyond that. Mostly, mostly uh, in Iraq, it was explosively formed projectiles or EFPs, uh, a lot of roadside bombs and whatnot, and, and, and maybe uh, small arms fire, depending on the nature, if it was a complex attack. In Afghanistan, it was it was a different kind of battle. We never saw the enemy in Iraq, but in in Afghanistan, you you know you would go toe to toe with the uh, Taliban. Oh yeah, they wanted to fight you. I remember my buddy Chris Vale when I first he first came on board into my team. I was giving him the in brief. I was like, yeah, these guys they like to fight. They're not afraid to fight us. And he just looked at me, smiled because he was a. Uh, former Marine himself, fought in Fallujah during the second uh, battle of Fallujah. And I mean, yeah, so he wasn't afraid of a fight. And so he looked at me, smiled, and said, a worthy adversary. I was like, bro, be careful of what you wish for, man. So he uh, and he ended up getting uh, killed in uh, September 2010. Uh, IED got him. But uh, yeah, I mean... It was two different wars there. I mean, I think, I mean, people tried to, people that had all this experience in Iraq tried to apply it to Afghanistan, and a lot of it didn't work because Afghans and Iraqis are two different cultures, two different people, and uh, also two different enemies. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, the Taliban had no problem going toe to toe with us. And, uh, but uh, like in Iraq, it was pop an IED, maybe pop off a few rounds, then get out of the area because they knew big army was coming. But it wasn't that. It was a little bit of the opposite in uh, Afghanistan. These guys would stand and fight you. So, yeah. Uh. There, there's, a, there's a huge difference in, in PSD and, and convoy operations as well because uh, – you know, like Ed had said earlier, that in PSD we're we're protecting clients. We're talking we're talking about people, and 
in in convoy were protecting cargo. And so that that might be, you know, the same risk factor or even a higher risk factor, uh, a person versus a, a piece of equipment or or what the case may be. But in PSD, we could we could haul ass. I mean, we we drove really fast. We drove in a tight unit. We were able to uh, offset. Uh, we had certain uh, uh, tactics that we used. And, and in convoy, you're only as fast as your slowest vehicle. So, and a lot of times uh, the road's not intact. So we had to find ourselves going off road quite often and it slows you down uh, so much that you can't, you're, you're like a sitting duck, you become a target. Uh, and you're a lot easier to hit at uh, 20 miles an hour than you are at 60 miles an hour, if that makes any sense at all. Mm. So. so in PSD, is, uh, is anybody game to be a client there? Or do you have certain rules on what clients you can work with? Pretty much, the, I the mean, contract the, contract takes the, the client. So if you have a Department of State contract, that Department of State could be a, a, it could be a governmental dignitary, it could be a high-ranking military official, it could be a, a VIP or a CEO. It, it all depends. I mean, we were moving attorneys, we were moving law enforcement officers, we were moving uh, people from the embassy to, to different venues. We were going from the airport to the hotel, from the hotel to the airport. I mean, we, we did a lot of movement. Uh, and, you know, we don't choose the client. The company or the contract chooses the client. And we just go and we pick the person up. We got, I remember one time we got a client that didn't, It was, there was no client. It was just a bunch of baggage. And then you get to where you're going, you find out it's like $3 million in cash, but they don't tell you that. It's not on the manifest. So, you know, why didn't they tell you that? Well, because they don't want you to turn left at New Mexico <laughs> and take a detour and not show up with the cash. But you know, in convoy, when talk when Ed talks about secure loads, we're talking about classified information. There, we don't we don't know what the manifest is. Uh, we just know that we have to move equipment, and, and we might know that it's food, ammo, fuel, weapons, or whatever the case that may be. But we don't know the specifics of those things, and and so that manifest is is uh, is is a dry manifest. We don't see anything about it. We just move the load. We do what we're told. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's. Uh... Get the uh, you, you got your three trucks. Make sure you keep rolling until you get to the drop site. That way, you know the load hasn't been tampered with, and that way the client is happy with what they're getting out of that uh, truck. Also, whether it's a sometimes it's a Land Cruiser that's in there, sometimes it's full of frozen food. I mean, you could usually tell the food trucks because you have a big refrigerator there. The reefer trucks are easy to ID. Sometimes it was fuel trucks. You just had to move all that fuel and they needed it for their generators and for their vehicles on the uh, fob. So, yeah, it was all. You know, I think the that. same thing applies to the mail, Nikos. We moved the mail, but the mail consisted of care packages. We had boxes. We had uh, equipment and gear. We don't know what's in the mail. We just move the mail. Okay. And so, I mean, if somebody wants to stuff $30,000 in a in a, in a inside a book and then stick it in the mail and try to send it home we're moving that stuff but we don't know what we're moving yeah okay it's just mail in general when it comes to secure loads it's just cargo in general make sense mm -hmm. okay so i think yeah, if you could both get me and the funny thing is is that the uh the ironic thing is i think is that when the military moved the mail the mail was not a priority for them which is why the military liked us to move the mail because that was our one job. Boom. You got one job. Move this mail from here to Jalalabad or to Ghazni or to Gardez. And, but with the military, if the threat level went up and they had to chop down the size of the convoy, the mail was the first thing to get dropped. So that's why uh, they really liked us to move the mail for them because they knew that was our priority. That was our mission in life. Get the mail to that fob. So, this PSD stuff sounds like an absolute riot. Basically, jumping up in some sipped up vehicle, bulletproof vehicle, and with a bunch of guns, picking up some dude or girl at the airport and driving as fast as you want down a city. It just sounds like great fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun until, until the shit hits the fan. But yeah, no, yeah, things start and blowing up, and it's like, all right, fun's over. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And you're working with a bunch of great guys that, uh, you know, we, we came, became friends for life. 
you know, because we're doing the same thing under under these um, circumstances. And you, you yeah, develop similar this mindset, uh, relationship. Right? Yeah. I mean, everybody got the same mindset. You're working with pretty much the same type of guy. And that's what you had. That's what I had in the military. And that was one of the things that attracted me to contracting was one of my buddies was like, uh, he had just retired and he's working for uh, the Crucible, a training, a contractor training company. And he's like, if you want to get out of them, if you're getting out, you want to work with these same type of guys that you're used to working with, making this kind of money in a high risk zone. I mean, give me your resume. And that's what got me into contracting. And then I, my very first contract in 2004 is at the embassy in Kabul doing the, the actual PSD uh, work. And then after that, I became a trainer for Crucible, training people on uh, marksmanship, uh, how to handle your firearms, and then also uh, motorcade and uh, PSD movement. After that, then I went over to SOC, and uh, I was just uh, – over there for uh yeah three years doing a uh doing uh the convoy security so i was wondering if you could give me a sort of first person view of your first psd trip in afghanistan how you woke up during the day and what you put, gear you put on and how you felt about this thing and, and if, if you can describe that without giving away any top secret details or anything. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, well, like I said, in, uh, on the very, like in 2004, between 2004 and 2010, a lot of differences because 2004, we had just kicked the Taliban out and we, uh, the focus was on trying to rebuild the country while it's still maintaining security. So we did all our moves. I mean, like, like the night prior, the afternoon prior, you'd uh, hey, you're gonna be moving these guys from uh, USAID down to Ghazni or Char, or you're heading up north to Charakar, which is north of Bagram. So here's what uh, I want you to link up with them. So we go ahead and talk to the client. All right, how many people you got? All right, we've got two limos or one limo, and you give them their brief there so they know what to expect and when they see a. When they see everybody showing up the next morning with guns, they know what to expect. Because you got to realize these folks are from USAID. They're not used to that. A lot of them are not used USAID? to that. USAID? So, yeah, USAID, USAID. Yeah, so they're, and it's they're a, not It's used a non governmental organization that uh, provides infrastructure, uh, support, money, et cetera. So all these clients are called NGOs or non governmental organizations. Your clients are kind of classified by uh, their level, I guess, of importance. That you'll have civilian clients, you'll have military clients, you'll have, uh, of, you know, Department of State clients that are political in nature, and and so uh, all of that. Uh, it, PSD is it's just like a blanket statement for moving one person from point A to point B, but there's a lot more that goes into it. Where uh, depending on the the level of security involved or the importance of the client, you might have to have one team that goes out and recons the, the venue. They, they do an advance on the venue so they know what it looks like and where to set everything up. And then another one will actually do the movement. And then there'll be a third one as a counter assault team or, or a QRF team in case something goes wrong on that mission. So that, that client dictated three separate teams. Some movements from the airport to the hotel and you're just picking up maybe an employee that's the only time they're outside the wire so you go over there and you'll have four people that just landed from the states you pick them up you brief them on what the mission's about what to do in case something goes wrong you get in the vehicle or you you haul ass to the to the to the location and you drop them off and you'll never see them again that type of thing until it's time for them to actually leave the country again and if you're on the same team that just so happens to pick that guy up, then you take him back to the airport. Uh, it's as routine as that. Um, but it's very detailed in terms of uh, the importance of the client. The client is what dictates the type of movement that we do for PSD. You know, the client and then the threat level at the uh, venue too. You know, the threat level at the venue might be really low. However, getting to the venue might be a really high threat level. So, you know, you're going to run that secure package, uh, a real heavy package 
getting to the front gate of the venue. And then once you're inside the venue, you just might be uh, one or two guys walking with all the clients and hang, and uh, just posting outside the, their meeting room until uh, they're done. And then you bring them back into the limo and then you get the package all ready. And then once again, the hot, the, the uh, heavy package is going to move them back to the uh, original fob. So, so, Ed, so go, you go back to where you are. You meet these guys at the airport with all these guns that are USAID. So what happens next? And you know, you brief them up. Hey, how are you doing? My, you introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Ed. And, uh, Here's what's going to happen today. You tell them what uh, where we're moving. Uh, you, you let them know what's going to be in front and rear vehicle wise, so that way they know what to expect. And you just tell them, all right, in the unlikely event that something does happen, uh, we're going to drive through. If we can't drive through, we're going to extract the vehicle. In the event we have to extract the vehicle, if it's not attached to you, it's going to stay in the vehicle. So like everybody, they actually their laptops that they'd have in their little satchels, they'd actually keep those on them the entire ride. Because they knew if something happened to that vehicle, we're just grabbing bodies and we're putting them into a, uh, another vehicle, a backup vehicle. And uh, it, if it's not attached to them, it's going to stay in the vehicle because we're going to burn the vehicle on the, as we leave. And then so how do you just, burn a vehicle quickly? You throw, throw a thermite grenade. grenade in there. Yeah. yeah. A grenade? Yeah, it's like a magnesium. It's like a big magnesium flare that you, boom, it's got a three-second delay. Throw it on the dashboard, and it'll just melt down into the engine block, catch the vehicle on fire, and then uh, burn the vehicle. How reliable is that to run a vehicle? Oh, pretty, pretty oh, yeah. reliable. <laughs> yeah. We've never pretty had reliable. one that didn't burn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, do you deck out your p- passengers with, with like body armor and stuff like that as well? Yeah, usually. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes that it's a requirement. Hey, you have to wear your body armor when you're outside the fob. It's a requirement for DOD, State Department, and also, I mean, if they blew it off, it it could it it could affect a uh, adversely affect an insurance payout. So. I remember uh, one uh, Dine employee uh, died from an IED strike, and what happened was uh, because they brought him back to the FOB without his body armor on, the assumption was he never wore his body armor, but somebody was filming the extract when that vehicle got hit, and they saw that he had his helmet on, his body armor on, and then they had to uh, go ahead and... uh, you have to pay him out. It was like, yo, he was wearing his body armor. So they always ask that question, too. If somebody gets hurt or killed, were they wearing their body armor? Were they wearing their helmets? So I'm amazed at how body armor hasn't really progressed for the last, I don't know, 20 odd has. years. They're still using this. It has. Oh, yeah. it, it has. It's, I mean, you have to really be attached to that industry to know things. I mean, we, you know, we've gone from Kevlar to level three to level four plates to ceramic plates to lighter plates to, to plates made out of plasma to wraparounds to ceramic yeah. discs. There, there's there's all kinds of different stuff out there. It all depends on what they provide you with when you run. Now, there are guys that might want to get plates or, or send something from home, but ITAR regulations prevent you from from ordering certain things from the United States and bringing them then into a foreign country. So you have to deal with what's available to you there. Why don't we have something like Master Chief where it's all ceramic interlocking plates? Oh, we did. We had vinegar dragon skin. We had dragon skin uh, that was ceramic that, that looked like dragon skin. It was the little ceramic plates and it was completely wrapped around. It weighed about 44 pounds. Yeah, it was heavy. So it was heavy. Yeah, that was heavy. I mean, well, that, so that would like shrink your spine. You wear that for a year on missions. Yeah, you probably come off of it an inch shorter. Not an inch shorter. But I mean, yeah. it'll do the job. It'll stop bullets. I just compress yeah, your great. spine. It was good. Yeah. Oh yeah. You wear that stuff for a twelve-hour shift, and you're it compresses on your spine, and then you wear it every day for a year or so, 
And uh, it, it's true. I, I, I lost an inch and a half from start to finish wow. in contracting. Yeah. Yeah. An inch and a half just by wearing body armor and, and yeah. Gear. Not just body armor. You got to wear load bearing vests over that. And, 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 and in my case, your it's medical, I have to carry medical equipment and all kinds of extra gear on top. So I, I probably weighed close to 300 pounds. Yeah. You're, 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 you know, you're totally two and a quarter right now. And I wore about 75 pounds worth of gear. Yeah. 60. Yeah. At least yeah. 60 pounds between body armor, ammo loadout. Yeah. You're talking about 60 pounds. So can you guys give me any, have you had any contact experiences when doing PSD? I, I never did on PSD. A, a couple of shots, uh, you know, they tag off the side of the truck. You, you know, you hear the ping and you just keep on driving. There are some cases yeah. where other teams got hit, you know, that we had to go uh, cross deck or, or uh, do QRF. And of course, Ed not doing PSD, but under in convoy, he, he's been hit quite a few times. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I lost, Jeez, I had to end up having to burn on two separate occasions. I had to burn a vehicle each time. So, uh, yeah. First time was a mine strike, and two of my gunners got injured really bad. The driver got shaken up, so I had to medevac those three and then burn that vehicle. But fortunately, the Army was, like, right close by. They saw the mine strike, so they were able to come on in. And they helped, really helped us out a lot when they facilitated that medevac and got my guys out of there. And then uh, because I was talking to them, they had uh, an airborne escort. They had uh, little gunships up there. They went ahead and uh, put missiles into the uh, downed uh, gun truck. Uh, then, the second, then the second time I was on my way to Oregon E and... Uh, yeah, my lead vehicle hit an IED. It was actually uh, command detonated. Uh, they found the wires and they found the OP where the uh, where the trigger man was at. And we went ahead and, uh, you know, we had to go ahead and cross deck. And it's kind of weird because when you do all your rehearsals for cross decking, it goes real fast. But reality is sometimes you're there for about 30 minutes because we had to secure everything come running up and I, I mean the 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 blast uh, blew open the back door of the uh, gun truck but it also it uh, blew out a lot of the gear and I'm, so I come running up with my medic John Pickett Buddha and uh, I saw this brown object laid out on the uh, on, on the ground I was like oh man tell me that's a sleeping bag please tell me that's a sleeping bag get down there, grab it, roll it over, and it's my interpreter. He was killed instantly. He was dead before he even left the vehicle because uh, his legs got amputated and there was no blood. So he was dead before he was even uh, out of the vehicle. And, uh, I mean, I must have had that weird look on my face looking at uh, the medic, Buddha. I was like, dude, can you fix this guy? And he's like, fuck him, he's gone, let's go. And it was like, all right, let's go. Boom, work to save the living. That's what you got to do. We saw movement in the back of the truck. He goes running. Uh, we go running for it. And then that's when I saw the right front door open up on the uh, gun truck. And that was my uh, ATL, my buddy Scott Brown. He comes out with an AK-47. And he runs up a, hun a hill, about 100 yards up a hill. I. Uh, what I didn't know at the time was he had two fractures in his pelvis and a broken back, and he was running up a hill. I was like, I finally catch up to him. I was like, dude, whatever you do, just stay here. Don't move. I can't afford to lose you. And he's like, oh, man, I'm all fucked up, man. I'm on adrenaline right now. I was like, all right, just stay here. And we go back down, and the driver was in a real bad shape also. So the uh, interpreter was dead. The two gunners were jacked up in the back. I mean, a lot of lower extremity injuries. And uh, the driver, he was uh, he took a brunt of the blast too, and a lot of internal or internal damage was done to him. So what we had to do, I mean, we just pulled him out of the vehicle, and he just was coughing up all this blood. And you just knew he wasn't going to make it. And I was like, sorry, man. So we got him, and then... Uh, the doc was just working on him for like the next 20 minutes, just trying to save him, but uh, he couldn't save him. 
And uh, but uh, the one thing I always remember from those two incidents: uh, training, 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 rehearsals, and training. Uh, you never rise to the occasion; you only default back to your training. And you might not train and rehearse for that specific scenario, but if you've been doing your uh, rehearsals, you know everybody's going to be clicking together and working together as a team, and you just go with it from there. What was that thing you said that takes 30 minutes cross something? Well, well, cross well, decking. well reality versus uh, rehearsals. You know, rehearsals, we, we, we practice our – we, we practice our cross decking. I mean, boom, usually within like two minutes, you're off the X. The reality is, though, sometimes, you know, you're there for 30 minutes because you're treating casualties, you're controlling the perimeter. Then you got to get moving after you, and then you got to uh, look at, look for any sensitive materials, burn the vehicles, and then uh, get out of there. Yeah, so it could be up to upwards of about 30 minutes sometimes when you're on that X, what we call the X. Cross deck, cross decking is, is moving an injured or, or a, a fatal injured uh, client from one vehicle to another. That's all. So if that vehicle gets hit, then you're, you're taught to bring your second vehicle up and provide cover, suppress a fire. Plus you're, you're providing uh, some kind of cover uh, from incoming fire and then you move uh, that vehicle, uh, you move all the clients out of that one vehicle into the unaffected vehicle, and then you drive off. That's cross decking. What side do you side do you decide to drive up onto? On the on the attack side, you go up on the attack side. Right. You put you you stage your vehicle on the side that you're being attacked, so that you know that you you have a better chance of getting somebody out of a vehicle, knowing that you have more armor plating on one side than you do on the other. I mean, if you're getting the attack from both sides, then what we'll try to do is set up some kind of a defilade or uh, position the vehicle so that we can have the best advantage to move the client. But we'll get as close as possible, sometimes just door to door. We open the two doors and they're touching each other. And now we have this little corridor that we're moving these people through. So, Ed, that, your lead vehicle, the what kind of vehicle was it that got blown up? Uh, we uh, used the uh, up-armored Ford F-550s. It was a Ford F-550, but they modified it through street armor. It was uh, it had a gun tub on it. It, if if you look at the cover of the book, you see the back end of uh, back end of it. That's what they look like. That was the F Ford F-550, and it had a place for two gunners. Uh, it was level seven. Yeah, I can't see it. No, nope. can't see it out. It might come out it? better in the video. It might come better once we upload the videos. Okay. Yeah, so they, so, didn't, they, they didn't give you M wraps or anything like that then. No, no, and I mean they were very effective against direct fire, mm -hmm. but it was flat bottom. And once uh, mm -hmm. the Taliban figured that out, I mean it was IEDs because mm -hmm. it was flat bottom, so all the blast would hit that flat bottom and it was 100 percent vehicle takedown it was catastrophic mm -hmm. versus like uh f-550s <clears throat> i mean uh m wraps they got that v-shaped hull yeah yeah and that blast would just dissipate out to the side and blow the wheels off but it would protect everybody inside yeah i so, guess you can you can even lift the suspension up and put something v-shaped underneath it because you need that i need a strong angle for yeah, that uh, deflection yeah. Yeah, but now you're talking major modifications. You're mm -hmm. talking money. And does corporate want to spend that money? A Ford F-150 doing that job, man. Sheesh, that is, yeah, that is yeah. scary, man. We had, uh, yeah, we had, the. I think we started off with like 17 or 18 of them. And I know I ended up burning two. Bedford ended up burning two. You guys ended I up burning one. one. Yep. Yeah. I think by the time we both left, we were down to like, they were down, the program is down to like 10 vehicles. How many vehicles to a trip? Typically, three. you try to make it three. Right. Yeah. So, so you'd, have your, you'd have your lead, and then you'd have your uh, your lead gun truck, and you'd either, once again, depending upon the threat level and how you've been running lately, you might want to change things up, the configuration of your uh, convoy. Sometimes we'd put the lead out as the rabbit, and then you'd have a – this number two gun truck was in front of all the cargo trucks. The number three was the trail, 
with the medic in it. Sometimes, you know, you'd go like lead, two cargo trucks, three cargo trucks, the middle gun truck, three cargo trucks, and then the trail. I mean, once again, you're just breaking up your uh, configuration so you're not doing the same thing every time. So what's worth of your experiences on your first mail trip? You sit down there, I guess, with your gun and your medic stuff on your lap, and you just sit there and, for like, what's it like? Oh, the first mail the trip was – yeah, yeah, first, I mean, I mean, you, the mail trips were, uh, once again, I mean, we, we we always briefed before, the night before. All right, all right, here, guys, we're moving to uh, Fob Fenty in Jalalabad. Uh, we briefed the road conditions, the threat levels, what to expect. You know, Fob, yeah, that JBAD run, Jalalabad run was interesting because it was all in a valley. 90% of that run was in a valley. And when uh, the Taliban hit us, they were up so high that our PKM machine guns, you couldn't elevate them. So the gunners had to go with AK-47s uh, up in the uh, up in the uh, gun turrets just to shoot back. So, but you'd, uh, you'd rehearse that also. That would be part of your rehearsals the night before. Also, the... Uh, you know, what to expect at the drop site, all right, getting through the gate, uh, linking up with the client at the post office, you know. So we pretty much we uh, offload the uh, inbound mail, and they'd already have a Connex box, a 20-footer full of outbound mail. We'd backload that onto the truck, and then we'd head back to uh, Kabul. So you basically just have these big trailers attached to your Ford 150s? No, 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 no. Those were they, they those, those those cargo trucks were separate cargo trucks. The gun mm-hmm. trucks were their own entity, mm-hmm. and the cargo trucks were their own entity. So each gun truck had four people. So it'd have a driver, a vehicle commander, and two rear gunners. Then usually an interpreter would uh, ride in the front vehicle. So if they ran across a checkpoint, then that person can uh, talk their way through that or translate for you. They also, we also use the translator to talk to the local national gunners. And so we, on each mission, we had a total of 13 guys on the mission, uh, but that did not include the drivers of the cargo trucks. And those were usually Indians or uh, local nationals or, uh, you know, immigrants from other countries. And they weren't part of our, they didn't include, they weren't included in the mission brief. They didn't know where we were going, when we were going to go, how we were going to roll. We, we did, we minimized for operational security. We didn't give them any information other than this is where you're going to be in the convoy. You're going to be the second vehicle in the convoy. And then they knew just to drive and follow us to where we were going. If anything happened, we would take care of them. But a lot of times they tried to do things on their own, like back up or, 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 or drive away or, or, or just jump out of the vehicle and run away and leave the vehicle yeah. unattended. There were a lot of times uh, where we couldn't really depend on these guys to carry out the mission. So we ended up training our own team on how to drive those trucks. Cause there would be times when we had to throw in an extra person uh, into a cargo truck just to get them off the X. Because the driver wouldn't that happened, uh, that, that wouldn't actually happened. The, that happened twice. Times, yeah. yeah. Actually, on the Sharona run, on the run to Sharona, that happened twice. The first time, uh, the driver got out of the vehicle and ran, and they never found him. Uh, they found him like about a week later in a ditch with. Uh, he was executed, and uh, the medic, and, and pretty much it was either going to be the medic or depending upon where the. Uh, the vehicle commander for the second vehicle was going to be uh, taking control of that vehicle that just got abandoned. And the second time it happened, kind of a funny story here. Uh, Driver jumps out of the vehicle, same run to Sharona, right around the four corners area. And he starts running back towards the gun truck. Well, they don't see him running back towards the gun truck. So the uh, dock runs up towards the, uh, mail truck without the driver in it so now doc drops up into the uh mail truck and he's starting to drive it off the driver 
jumps back into Doc's old seat inside the uh, F-550. <laughs> and he's like, okay, I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. They weren't too pleased with him. They wanted that. to kill that guy. I didn't know who he was. They were trying to jump in the vehicle. And they yeah. almost shot him. Yeah. Well, once he's he ID'd himself, they're, they're like, all right. But when they got him back, they were like, oh, really? <laughs> so, yeah. I think uh, the, the Afghans took care of him. <laughs> so so how, how long are these technical... Had... Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, you go anywhere. No, I said, you know, the time that we had to drive was uh, we ended up removing the driver because he was intoxicated on, on cot. He was taking, uh, he was smoking cot and, uh, and taking opium. So, uh, and he couldn't drive. So we, we just took him out of the vehicle and drove the vehicle ourselves. So how long are these typical mail trips? Oh, wow. Usually about long, s- long time there. About couple, six uh, hours, twelve to fourteen hours. Sometimes eighteen hours. Sometimes twenty-four Jeez. hours. Do you get a chance to take breaks and or stop or? Well, when you're to- on the road, no, you keep pushing. You get to the road. You you get to the yeah. next drop site. But once you're there, then I mean, you, that's your break. Then you come on back. Well, if you need to go to the bathroom when you're on this trip, trip like eight hours uh, onto it. Yeah. We stopped. We, we, have to fuel, we have to fuel at one point, so we we dominate the fuel point, and then the, you can get out of the vehicle. You can get get a drink or take a leak or whatever you need to do at that point there. But if you have to go, uh, we're not going to make a special stop just for you. So you know, you either put it in a jar or hold on to it or 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 deal with it. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. It could be kind of hard to concentrate if you're like in a car and you're. All- <laughs> We had the one yeah, guy that yeah. was pretty. We yeah, had one guy who was pretty sick that jumped out of the vehicle and uh, oh, it was yeah. right in the middle of a firefight, and uh, he was shitting on the side of the truck, and um, he jumped back in the vehicle and then would take off and run. Sometimes the vehicle was moving when he jumped out. You know, I mean, yeah, you just it, it happens. You know, shit shit happens. <laughs> yeah. Um. So what? So what are you guys um, up to now? Then what's your, what's your plans for the next few years? Oh, geez, pushing the book now, marketing. <laughs> yeah, put yeah, the book no, out no, there. I mean, I, I mean, I'm working now. I mean, I work part time. Uh, I'm fitness trainer, and I also drive for uh, FedEx. Still moving the mail. Go define the <laughs> define irony. Yeah. And I'm so, still a medic. And I really like uh, I really I really like being a fitness trainer, helping people out, helping them hit their goals. Plus, uh, I like doing the uh, FedEx because you know you're just out there. You, you you're on your own. As long as you get all your drops done, everybody's happy. So, yeah. I work for a community fire rescue as a firefighter paramedic, and I, I work in a bad part of town. So. Uh, I'm doing the same job, just in a different area, and the only difference is I can't shoot back. <laughs> do you ever do stuff for the military? Nah, I'm done. No, I'm I mean, finished. I trained as a corpsman in the military, but nothing for the military, not since I got out, no. So you would yeah, be tempted no. to go back contracting? I oh, too no, old I'm now. Not gonna go back. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, you got a whole new generation out there, all that young blood out there. Let them handle it. Plus, contracting itself has changed a lot. Jeez, uh, I mean, from I've watched it change from 04 to 2012. Back in 2004, 2005, 2006, it was what they called the gold rush years. Guys okay, were making no less than I, yeah. $500. Yeah, and guys were coming in making no less than $500 a day. But then, uh, and uh, but then they did start to get a handle on it, uh, for cost effectiveness. Uh, you know, got you could you had to affect you had to cut back on the paychecks, also, uh, rules of engagement, plus all the politics that's involved with uh, corporate working with uh, the state department or the department of defense. There's a lot of politics there, plus, the corporate wanting to push their profit. So it all uh, it, it changes the uh, it, it changes up the dynamic of contracting a lot because uh, you got to still remember this is a, still a business and corporate still wants to make their profit. Uh, but uh, and it, it's tough on the security side, especially mobile security, because 
you can either A, make a lot of money, or B, lose a lot of money. And I think uh, with Sock Day, lost a lot of money because uh, just the amount of casualties we took, uh, vehicles. I'd say every time we took, ca uh, we, we took casualties and we had to burn a vehicle between the casualties and the vehicle and the equipment lost, the, uh, the, the payouts for medical and deaths, I mean, you're, you're talking like close to a million dollars easily. And shoot, that happened for me twice. So, so, so who's who's losing money there exactly? The government or the taxpayer or for what? Uh, the, co the corporate corporate is. Oh, so they they the they're they're taking on no, the yeah. risk as well. Not they're not insured for that. No, we're we're the ones that are taking the risk on. We work yeah, for yeah, the, the company. Government's not taking the risk. We are. Yeah. <clears throat> <coughs> corporate, yeah, you're, uh, taking, corporate. you're risking your life in terms of like finances. Yeah, I mean, you gotta understand, we were making pretty good money, but we were at the lower end of the pay spectrum. That should give you an idea of the amount of money that's involved with war. So, yeah, I mean, we had to so work corporate, in, yeah. I mean, eventually they had to draw a line. I know with Sock, they finally said enough. It was it May 2011? Bedford's team lost five guys in one uh, in one vehicle i mean uh it, it the blast <coughs> flipped the vehicle up, built all five inside of it in their efforts vehicle uh yeah they ended up crashing into the crater so they ended up losing two vehicles they ended up guys. losing two vehicles out there that uh on that one hit so and once and once again, corporate's now looking at the numbers like, all right, we got to drop this program. We we got to get out of this. So, so, so corporate sock, yeah, yeah, sock. And what is sock? Special operations consulting. And that's a that's that's a for profit company. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. It's a company. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a it's a security company. Uh, or it was when we were there. I'm right. sure right now it's morphed into something else. So so. <clears throat> Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, they do uh, assessments, um, uh, security assessments. They do static security. They do mobile security. They do canine, <clears throat> EOD bomb detection. They train dogs for for uh, uh, law enforcement agencies now. They 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 do the entire uh, spectrum or the umbrella of security is basically what mm. they do. Um, they have training elements. They have all kinds of stuff in uh, in terms of their own infrastructure, but it's a private company that hires people at a certain amount of money to do a certain type of job in a certain type of environment. So, and they base everything on the type of environment. So, you know, there are parts of Afghanistan that they would consider what they call semi-permissive, but we ran high risk, high threat <laughs> mobile operations. And so that's, that's the highest threat level. It's the highest risk. It doesn't necessarily come with the highest pay, but it paid well. But it, you got to look at the risk versus benefits type of a thing. So, I mean, there are a lot of times that we, we weren't really there for the money. We were just there to, you know, to continue to serve our country or to work with other guys that we knew were like-minded individuals, things of that nature. You know, there are days, yeah, when when it is semi permissive, where you do a run to to a location that's not uh, difficult to get to, and, and you would say, okay, this, now I'm making what I'm considered what I'm worth. But there are other times you knew you were going to get hit, and it, it there's not any kind of money in the world that's going to compensate you for the loss of one of your guys, and no. uh, and, and so it's it's not a it, it wouldn't be a comparable deal. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, families are are uh, given benefits through defense base act, but you can't put a price tag on somebody's life. So, you know, what does that, what does that equate to in terms of uh, uh, a monetary value there? You can't, it's, it's a, it's a non-replaceable thing The if you ask me, it should be non ending money to family members. You know, they should, if that guy's job was to take care of his family for the rest of his life, then it's the company's job to take care of that family for the rest of that employee's life. You know, so that's the a, way I look. If something happens to you as a contractor, is there less benefits than if if you're employed by the military? No. Like, uh, I know. Well, uh, I, as a veteran, we can capitalize on 
of veteran services only because we're veterans didn't have anything to do with the fact that we got injured uh, working as security contractors. You know, when you file a claim, you file it through the Defense Base Act, not through the not through the government. And the Defense yeah. Base Act is is a federal program through the Longshoremen's uh, Compensation Fund. So uh, that's a different type of workers' compensation for overseas employees. So this company, ESOC, SOC, uh, they they were given the contract by the U.S. some U.S. military, and then they basically so, no, looked at not the military, the Department of Defense, right? Yeah, and to then they that. and they ended up looking at all these. They're losing money from doing this mail operation. And so who so does the they, mail once you're gone? Uh, so they sold the contract off to another company. Right. To another company. And then they it. picked it up. Right. And somebody else was willing to step in and assume the risk. <laughs> and they, were they aware of what happened? Like, I guess. Oh, well, yeah. I'm sure they were. Sure. Yeah. It's so all full disclosure. Yeah, yeah. Because there has to be full disclosure for all mm. of that. When you're coming in, so it's not it's not a very good business model financially to do this meal operation stuff. Well, it's it just, is no, if you don't ever get hit. Yeah, I yeah, mean, if you, can, if you don't ever get yeah. hit and you don't ever lose vehicles and personnel, it's it's you're going to make money. But once right. again, once you start losing, once you start getting hit, vehicles start going down, and people start getting injured or killed, you start losing money, and. This was just one of those programs that was just like very high risk. You know, even our Afghan gunners were like some of the most highly paid in the country uh, compared to other contracts with locals on them. Uh, But uh, yeah, no, I mean, I remember talking to one guy. He's like, I'm going to get out of the security side and go into the life support side. I was like, what is that? And he goes, no, you just set up these fobs and you just keep the fobs running. I was like, really? He goes, yeah, bottles of water don't complain. I was like, oh, you know, you got a point there. <laughs> yeah, you just show up, make sure there's water on the bit, fob. You make sure that uh, the fob is uh, stocked with uh, you know, the defect and the food. Bunkers are built in case of uh, an emergency in that you have a security force in place, but you never really leave the wire. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of companies were pushing towards the static side, what we, what we call the static side, the life support side, because it's a lot safer, a lot lower risk. And, uh, you know, you're still going to have a payout. You're still going to make a profit. I mean, the only way you're going to move lose money on that is if your fob gets overrun. Or, yeah, if your fob gets overrun, that's the only way you're going to lose money there. Other than that, I mean, you know, you're not going to lose money. Because once again, I mean, Bottles of water, cans of food, that's like, say, 80% of it. And then, you know, dealing with the static guards and uh, all the people on there, making sure the internet's up and running. That's it. Is there many FOBs still in existence by the Department of Defense right now? Uh, Not in Afghanistan. No, the, yeah. they, it depends on what country you're in, but they, you know, they set up anytime you have a military operation that's in a forward operating area, then they have to have a base or a man camp that's that's constructed to uh, provide security for those for those elements that are living there, so to speak. Uh, uh, most people work either at a military base or some kind of an outpost that's uh, already a secured element. But let's take uh, Iraq, for instance, in in Basra, which is where all the oil is being taken up out of the ground. They have to build all these man camps for companies like Shell and Slumberjay and Halliburton and KBR and all that. that, that they're the ones that are responsible for bringing oil out of the ground. Well, you got to build a camp and uh, that camp has to be secure and it has to be, you know, so, so those private military companies that are doing that, they're also doing these infrastructure projects uh, building man camps and, and doing what. But that entails a lot of other things like e- explosive ordnance disposal. A lot of these oil sites are on areas that are inundated with ordnance from previous wars like the Iran-Iraq War in 1980. There's, I want to say, drain those marshes, man, there were undetonated bombs all over the place. 
And, and so they had to have EOD personnel come in there and, and uh, safe in the area. And then they had another company come there and excavate. And then another company came in there and built everything up. And then now another company comes in there and provides the security that all falls under one umbrella. So there's a lot of money to be made. It's going to be so many years, decades before Ukraine has all those. Well, I guess we're still fighting World War II bombs unexploded. But... Yeah, I think that in that case there, uh, it's... It's a question of uh, airspace now. Uh, that's what dictates what happens on the ground and uh, not being able to bring in uh, NGOs or, or private military assets. You know, there are, I mean, I got a job offer to work in the Ukraine and paid almost $5,000 a day. They needed medics that bad. But, uh, you know, and I'm just saying, am I, am I either that crazy or I, I took a hard look at it. I thought about going there. But they said, no, you got to go in from Poland and then they're going to take you in through ground. And so then that tells me, how am I going to get out if something goes wrong? Well, there is no way to get out. And so uh, that's why they're paying so much money, because you're basically a write off in terms of uh, what you can provide and how long you can provide it for while you're in that country, because it's not semi pervasive It's completely hostile. So, um, so but who, once who would be paying, who would be paying 5000 Who would be paying yeah, 5000 a day? Oh, if, yeah. if you're allowed to share that information. <laughs> I was... Yeah, I, I think it's down to a couple grand a day now. But, uh, you know, that was that was at, you know, at the peak so far. But who's to say that the peak hasn't ended or that it's going to get even worse? So, uh, you know, the unpredictability of that country is what is what's going to happen in terms of uh, uh, private security companies, because you need uh, you need PS. The, uh, you need private security companies to augment military operations. Military wants to be free to do offensive things. They want to be able to uh, focus on the task at hand and not worry about all these little ancillary items. And that's why they utilize uh, private military companies. Yeah. So Ukraine right now, basically, it's, it's gone from um, this is planned power cuts to planned ons. So a lot of areas where the you'll be told this is when your electricity will be on and the rest of the time it's off. So you can plan your charging your batteries and your fridges and things like yeah, that. We, did that in Baghdad. Yeah. we had on and off days in Baghdad as well. So, and then there's going to be times when they're going to start supplementing operations by bringing in generators and, and all kinds of things where they can become a little bit more independent or self-sufficient. But uh, until everything settles down, you know, it's really unpredictable. So, yeah. Okay. Well, guys, this has been a fascinating time to talk to you guys, and hopefully, you guys can get your a movie out of this or something. Well, that would be an interesting, uh, <laughs> yeah, or documentary or whatever, you know. So, yeah. Well, I I think they're working on a documentary. I, we also like to probably uh, try to get a commemorative stamp commissioned by the United States Postal Service to honor the guys that that uh, that we lost, and that's that. You know, that's the what the book is about is our fallen brothers and, and, you know, of course the theme is brotherhood. And then, you know, there's a sub sub theme with uh, the corporate side of war because it is private security contracting. And so, you know, we're just trying to get the word out there and educate the public on what we did while we were in Afghanistan. So we, we appreciate you having us on the show and yeah, uh, we look you. forward to uh, talking to you in again in the future. Yeah. Sounds good. And how do people go to find out about this book? Well, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's at Barnes and Noble, and we have a Kindle edition. And Ed and I are tossing up the idea of an Audible book. So uh, once we can get that figured out, then uh, we'll we'll probably go Audible as well. And do you guys yeah. have a website? We do. Yes. It's uh, postcardsthroughhell dot com. Okay. Uh, one word, and then uh, it's got pictures. It tells you a lot about the book and and uh, all all our reviews and endorsements on there as well. So we know it's going to be a bestseller. Brilliant. Okay, Gay. Well, thanks, Ed and Alan, and I look forward to um, catching up with you again. And um, all right, Nikos. Thanks. Take care. Thank you, Nikos. All right. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye.